right, let's go to Kevin in Los Angeles. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thanks, Dave. Uh, just a quick question. When choosing a mutual fund, how much weight should I give ratings from websites like Morningstar.com? So, for instance, I'm, I was looking at two different mutual funds and their performance over the past 10 years. One of them looked like it had been doing slightly better than the other, but Morningstar gave it three stars where the other had five stars. Should I factor that in when choosing? Morningstar's rating is risk-adjusted, and so they're, p- they're pulling up the beta, the volatility of the fund, uh, and adjusting on that probably. That's how they used to do it. I haven't subscribed to them in a long time. Uh, when I was back, back when I was in the business, and then when I first started on the radio, I kept Morningstar on my computer before there was an internet. We used to get CD-ROM updates quarterly on them. And uh, so they're an old rating system. They've been rating mutual funds a long time. But if I remember correctly, they're risk adjusted, and that may explain it. If you'll go pull the what's called the beta, the beta is the st- statistical measure of risk. And you'll probably find that three star has a higher beta that to get to a slightly better rate of return, it went through higher peaks and lower valleys. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that does make sense. I'm um, guessing, but I'm, I'm guessing, like but was, I'll bet you that's what you find. Yeah, it looked like the other things that were factoring in were things like how often the fund manager shifted and stuff like that. So, like, not just volatility in the market of the fund, but like the volatility of the management of the fund. That would, like they would they would look at that as well. That does make sense. So it could be that in addition to the beta. Now, here's the thing: uh, if you're looking at fund volatility based on management, there's uh, more and more of the funds have gone to a team management style rather than a singular rock star manager. That way they're not as dependent on that one guy for their future returns. In other words, if you had a, a history of 10 years of great returns and it was a rock star manager model, not a team model managing it, and the rock star guy leaves, well, the track record kind of leaves with him, right? But if you've got a team yep. model and two of the 15 people running the fund Uh, that are the brains causing the return to happen over the last 10 years leave, well, you probably can say uh, that that history is probably valid for projecting into the future, common sense-wise anyway. And so a lot of the funds have gone away from rock star managers for that reason, and they've gone to team management because that validates their their historical returns that way into the future and can project them into the future. But you can just look at that. I honestly, I mean, I'll glance at that kind of stuff. I am mainly looking at the track record. And is there some reason that the track record isn't valid because the whole team left or there's a complete turnover in style or a philosophy shift in the management or something like that? Unless there's something that invalidates the track record, I'm spending like 85% of my issue when I'm picking a fund on track record. I'll look at the volatility. I'll look at the other stuff. I'll look at the expense ratios. I'll look at all the other stuff. But it's a very small percentage of how much time I spend on that kind of thing. And, Kevin, I'll tell you one other thing. The fact that you're asking these questions means you're going to win. And here's let me give you the reason why. There's a, a, a group of actuarial nerds that studies retirement stuff. Um, and it's like 17 initials. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, I was put looking at one of their studies not long ago. And they found that 78% of the predictive reason for someone becoming wealthy using an investment is savings rate. Now, let me translate that. What that means is 78% of the way you can predict whether someone makes a bunch of money in an investment is if they actually invest. (laughs) That's what that means. No (laughs) <laughs> How expensive was that study? Jeez. And, and the point being, though, that this group of nerds figured out that, you know, this nuanced stuff of a beta or an expense ratio or team versus rock star. Doesn't matter. Put money into a retirement If you account. just will freaking do it, you're just like going to win. OK, I mean, compared to the people who overanalyze and don't do anything. Right. And so you don't get caught up in paralysis of the analysis, Kevin. Get her done, baby. That's the moral of the story. So I spend a certain amount of time in looking at this stuff, and if one of them starts tanking on me, I may move it, but I'm just putting it in there. Yeah. When in doubt, when in doubt, swing the bat or you ain't going to hit the ball. That's I mean, this is like rock. It, it's just the funniest thing I ever read because because people in the business, they all get mad at Dave Ramsey because he's too primitive and he doesn't actually understand, doesn't have the intellect to grasp all of the nuances of the investing world. 
Yeah, yeah. obviously I don't. Uh, but but you know, and so but the truth is, seventy eight percent has to do with whether you actually did it. <laughs> I saw so. that the other day. Someone was asking some some fitness people, "What's the best workout? What's the best workout?" And finally, one guy snapped and said, "Any one that you will do. That's the best one. <laughs> the one you don't quit Just doing. Just keep doing it. The one yes. that you don't quit doing. Get in the game. Yeah. I mean, this, this is some genius advice we're doling out here, man.